I did have a guy that I was friends with. I had been friends with for a long time, who I also knew had the same habit as me. And I thought, well, we'll just, I'll just be with him, and we end up homeless together. So I go, I bit, I bit so bad off. Um, would use my faith. Um, at one point, I had track all through here. Um, this big hole right here is from Immersa. I was using my faith, and I would put my situation off on my head. And me. And um, I called that off that you have to be. So that was Nicole Shatania. She is our guest today. She's also quite well known as Nicole Victorious on TikTok. If you want to go over there and give her a follow, she has a massive following. And that's because her story is completely unique. I've never heard some of the things that she said to me today. And after 240 some odd episodes, you think I would have heard it all by now. No, I have not. So check it out, guys. It's a great episode. Hey, listen, if you are enjoying our content, if you could give us a like, share, comment, you know, smash the subscribe button if you're on YouTube or Spotify. It really does help us out to keep spreading the message, and I appreciate it every single time. And, of course, our title sponsor for today's episode is FAR Canada. That's Families for Addiction Recovery. They are all about the families of people who suffer in addiction. They have a, they have a bunch of different resources going that way, including a peer-to-peer support system, which is just absolutely amazing in my mind. They also have a uh, kind of a helpline of sorts, a uh, support line that's open kind of during business hours so with time zones and that. You'll have to check out their website uh, for more on that one. Um, but lastly, what they do is they advocate behind the scenes in a big, big way. Angie Hamilton, their founder, is, a, is an ex-lawyer, uh, so that's kind of in her wheelhouse. But check them out, guys. They're at farcanada.org. And in the meantime, I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Watchers, listeners, supporters of all kinds. Welcome to another episode of the Ashes to Awesome podcast. I'm your host, Chuck LaFlange, checking in from Krabby, Thailand. Halfway around the world in Louisiana, United States, is Nicole Chattinger. Did I get it right, Chattinger? Yes. Sorry? Shatania. Shatania. Nobody I was gets it right. <laughs> close. Wow. Okay. Shatania. I should have asked that ahead of time. How are you doing today, Nicole? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. It's uh, 1030 at night here in Thailand and uh, still still pretty nice and warm out. So I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, you're in Louisiana. She is, is she's all hot and bothered there, is it? Yes. Yes. So yeah. hot. <laughs> so hot. It's not even no noon and it's so hot. No kidding. Well, I can relate to that. That's a similar thing going on here during the day. So, hey, so we haven't had much of a chance to talk, you know, pre record and all that. I know you've got a hell of a story. I know you're a three time convicted felon, former IP drug user. You said a couple of things in your reels that I want to jump on just for some language that you've used that I'm like, ooh, that's interesting to me. So, but we'll get all to that when we get to that. So, awesome. in the meantime, one of the things I like to do when we first start on an episode is, do you remember the first time you got messed up? On drugs? Yeah. I can remember yeah. the first time I abused it. I am a product of the opioid crisis. So okay. like, I've never smoked a cigarette. I drank a little in high school and college, no biggie, um, and was in an accident. And this is the very beginning of 2000 where they're just over prescribing. And uh-huh. so I remember the first time I abused it, my tolerance had built before I was just trash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm gonna make myself bigger. Okay. Um, do you remember how it made you feel? There's a couple of questions. I've got some follow-up stuff here. So do, do you Absolutely. remember how it made you feel when you abused it there the, the first time? How was that? Yes. No, yeah. and that's exactly what I was looking for. Okay. I didn't and how want old to feel you, anything. How old would you have been by at that point then? 20, about 25. 25, so a late bloomer, a late bloomer into oh, the yes. abusing of the narcotics, right? Okay. And I, okay. yes, I didn't even use the needle till my mid thirties. No kidding, eh? No kidding. So you wanted to feel numb. See, this changes my whole line of question because normally it's somebody who's very young. So you have to, you know, and, and I, then I go in to say, were you self-aware enough at the time to know what it was doing for you? But it sounds like, yeah, you definitely were. I mean, but you're in your mid twenties by then. That's yeah. what you're looking for. So yeah. That's yeah, exactly yeah. what I was looking for. Um, Okay, well, I'm going to let you tell your story the way you tell your story. I, I just, I like to ask those few questions right off the bat, and uh, we'll just kind of go from there. So, yeah. I'm an open book. You can, like I said, you can ask me anything. I grew up in the South, obviously. Uh, I couldn't so tell. I couldn't tell. You couldn't tell at all, could you? <laughs> no, I, I was thinking Boston. I don't know, right? Yeah. Probably, <laughs> yeah, that was it. But um, my, the reason my testimony is so important to me is because I think with addiction, people stereotype. And they think that it's only a certain type of person that it happens to. And if you look at my childhood, 
it was the all American childhood. I'm an only child. Um, I was spoiled rotten to the point to where it almost formed a, a disability. Um, that was not intended. I was just really loved. Um, I was super popular in high school um, and most people might have wanted to had they, my experience, but what they didn't know is I've had horrible self-esteem issues my whole entire life. I never was good enough for myself and I'm very, very empathetic and I never, ever, ever would make fun of anybody. I was all the time taken up for other people, even though I was the popular girl. I was kind of a loner too. I didn't run with the mean girls. I didn't care for them. I went to a gigantic high school. And I think the reason why what I was popular is because I was nice to people. Like I was all the time taken up for people, which is odd because I wouldn't take up for myself. I would take up for somebody else, but not myself. And I really had no coping mechanism. So I just kind of slide through life. Um, and when I get to college, I'm, I realize that um, I don't even know who I am. I don't know what I want. Um, I don't want to go to class anymore. I don't want to be a straight A student anymore. Um, I had danced my whole entire life and I had done what everything had been expected of me. Like I never even got sent to the principal's office. So how do I get three felonies? Hey, just want to interrupt before we get too far into the episode to remind you about our special sponsor for today's episode, and that is the Yatra Trauma Treatment Center here in Krabby Talent, where I reside. They are all about trauma. That's what they do. They do it very, very well. Um, my personal healing journey began in Thailand when I attended their 30-day residential treatment program. Um, it included everything from internal family systems therapy to EMDR therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, Tai Chi, yoga, ice baths. Oh, there's all sorts of things that went on there, and uh, my life has been forever changed. I will scream my praises from the rooftops for the rest of my life. So check them out, guys. Um, you can learn more about them, how to contact them, and, of course, a bunch of the episodes that Mike Miller, the head clinician, has been on with us at, at a2apodcast.com slash trauma. Back to the show. Yeah, it, no kidding. Right. It, and that's, I think, the importance of my testimony is don't think addiction can happen to you or your family. Because yeah. it absolutely can. <laughs> and, um, yeah, yeah. and that's why I tell it. But uh, when I was 20, I got pregnant with my son, who's 23 now. And I was with a guy that um, I really didn't know that well. I had just gotten out of a five-year relationship. And at 20, our six-year relationship, if you think about that, that's that's a it's, long that's, time. It right. is. Yeah, it's, so it's a quarter of your life just, or more, right? So, right. Yeah. so <laughs> I'm just like basically with this guy and I wind up pregnant and I know that I don't want to be with him. So I break up with him, not saying, hey, you can't be a part of the child's life. I didn't say that. But long story short, I hadn't seen him since. So, okay. I mean, yeah. yeah, that was just, and it really didn't even upset me. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. It just didn't. Um, and I got two jobs. I was waiting tables at night at Outback Steakhouse and working at a hair salon during the day. And um, I was not, I mean, of course I was scared because I was pregnant, but it wasn't affecting me, I don't think, normally the way another person would. I don't really have mm -hmm. coping mechanisms. And I think I buried myself in the work and trying to, you know, save up money. Which, which I would argue is a coping mechanism. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I trip, like We're I, I, here. Think, I understand. <laughs> you know, I think that maybe yeah, I should have been more scared, and I don't know. I fell yeah. in love with my son. Like I just fell in love with him. Um, yeah. And was like, okay, let's well, whatever. I slipped and fell at Outback Steakhouse um, at seven okay. months pregnant, and my kneecap goes to the back of my leg, and when it hits the ground, it breaks in mm. three pieces and cuts the inside of my leg up. Oh. And now oh. I'm like, this is serious. Like all I was worried about was my son. Um, yeah. That was the only thing on my mind. And I remember laying on the ground thinking, hey, move, move, you know, like do something. Let me know you're okay. And he did. And when they got me to the hospital, they were like, his, they had to do an amniocentesis. His lungs weren't developed. They're like, if we do the surgery on your leg to repair it, it could cause you to go into labor. He could have problems. And I was like, don't do it. I'll, then I'll just be crippled. Don't do it. Wow. And wow. so I laid there in that bed for about six or seven weeks, waiting on him to be ready. Yeah. Um, and gave birth like that. I call it the National Lampoon Child Delivery. 
<laughs> I had this woman holding up this broken leg and, you know, I giving dinner. And I just, that wow. was, yeah. And I think that was the first thing where other people were like, she's so strong. And I still didn't see it. Yeah. Like, I just didn't yeah. see it. Um, and like I said, I just fell in love with my child and everything is copacetic. I end up having like 12 surgeries. Um, and I'm not abusing the drugs. Like I, they're over prescribing. I'm getting OC80s, um, Annex, Somas, Ambien, you name it, I've got it. Percocet breakthroughs, um, you know, and I'm just not wow. taking them as prescribed. I'm in therapy, learning how to walk again. Me and my son learned to walk together. I'm in school to be a, a medical esthetician and I'm fighting through this until mm -hmm. my, my little boy is two years old. And you asked the first time, if I remembered the first time, you know, that I'd been trashed or, or messed up or, and this was the first time I abused it. Um, my little boy's hair started to come out. Um, I, we laugh. He's hairless like a cat on Austin Power. I, like, but we can laugh about it now. But in, the, in that time span, my heart just cracked. And I didn't understand what was happening. And I had mentioned that I'd never make fun of anybody. So now my kid is going to be made fun of. And I'm pissed off. I'm mad at God. I'm like, this is not happening. I couldn't protect him. And it took a while for all the hair to come out. And we were in Walmart one day and this family's like staring at him. And like, he's got three eyeballs. He was called a creep. Um, they would come up to like right in front of him and ask me when he was going to die. Cause they thought he had chemo, you know, he was going through chemo treatments and um, I just couldn't take it anymore. It was around Christmas time and they were staring at him and pointing and laughing. I, I told Colby, I said, hold my purse. And I pushed the buggy. You know how they make castles out of Oreo cookies? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just <laughs> through the Oreo I'm like, no, you got something to look at, you know? And I'm fussing oh, and I'm wow. mad. I get thrown out of Walmart and I come home that day and I open up my medicine and it's full of pills. And I didn't want to feel anything anymore. So I took mm -hmm. a handful of them. And that is how it began for me. Um, I was a functioning addict for a super long time. Yeah. I graduated from aesthetic school and I was working at El Dorado Casino uh, with extremely wealthy people, which got me on movie sets. Movies are filmed in Shreveport and I'm popping 40 perks a day. And Shit. yeah, nobody has a clue. Um, I look like I have it together. I'm a PTA mom. Um, yeah. I'm taking him to, you know, alopecia camp every year speaking to other parents but behind closed doors i'm a mess like yeah. i'm crying all the time and if i could go back in time i'd slap the mess out of myself it was hair yeah no kidding right no kidding but like there's so many yeah. what stays out there but yeah. well, my and, little and of course 20... now the life you've lived gives you all sorts of you know right. um perspective but at my 20 year old self yeah my, you know yeah, by then yeah. i'm about 25 but I just couldn't deal with it. And I, you know, my tolerance is building, my tolerance is building. And I got dope sick before I knew what dope sick was. Um, my, my pills had been up at the pharmacy for about a day or two. And I thought I had flu. I'm laying in bed, fluish. Yeah. And yeah. then I get my pills and my mom noticed it. My mom was like, Nicole, you're not sick anymore. And, you know, I'd like to say I had a, a, a wonderful moment and got my life together right then and there, but I didn't. I went into denial and it got yes. so much worse. Yes, as it does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it just got so much worse. And fast forward, you know, I'm making a ton of money and my fuel habit. At one point, I was under three pay management contracts and mm -hmm. I'm still buying them on the street. But then I get in trouble, you know, with that. So now I've gone to completely buying the pills off the street. But it's not affecting my pocketbook. Like, I've, I'm making so much money. It's not really causing a negative effect on my life, except when I don't have any. And it's not because I'm broke. It's because everybody on the street's out. So yeah. then I can't work, you know. And that's yeah. when the, neg the negative stuff starts. And I had, I had lived my life kind of for everybody else. Like, mm -hmm. I, after years of being in therapy, I needed my mom's approval super bad and it was on an abnormal level. And um, 
I don't, she didn't ask for that. It's something that just went wrong with me, but I, understand. Yeah. I wanted to rebel. And there was this guy that I'd known my whole life, but I hadn't seen him in nine years. Why? Because he's in prison. And that sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, the smart parts were working strong that day. Um, yes. He had just gotten out, and um, I met him, you know. I'm like, yeah. hey, what's up? You know, and he's remembering Miss Goody Sushi's America from high school. Why in the world would yeah. she be messaging me? And I bring up the fact that, you know, I've got a field problem or whatever, and he's going to meet me on the roof of the boat. My life changes that day. Yeah. Um. I knew it was a bad idea. I knew that this was going to end badly, but there was something so unhinged and unhealed in me. I grabbed on to him. And I tell people all the time, like the devil doesn't show up looking like a monster. He doesn't look like the demon in the movies. He looks like everything you think you want. And the whole romanticize of the body and Clyde type thing, it was appealing at the time. Now I'm like, give me Johnny and June, y'all kiss my butt. But <laughs> at the time, it was like, this sounds exciting. It was almost like I was so bored because I had made it. By now, I'm like 28, 29. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, I've never really done anything bad. You know, I didn't even break curfew in high school. So like, I'm going for this. We start this love affair and it's crazy because I thought he was the love of my life and I'm so glad he wasn't. And I'll, I'll get to, to the good part like with the actual love of my life later. But um, I became consumed with this individual and he became consumed with me. It was like an addiction. Oh yeah. Codependency. He, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. And I, right. And I wanted him because I thought he was the unattainable, you know, it was kind of this wild idea of instantly get married and instantly get pregnant. I did manage before, cause he went away for 11 months. He got busted and I, I held him down and that's when we decided to get married and have a kid. So okay. I went and got on Subutex, weaned myself off. So when he got home, we could get pregnant because I didn't want to bring it. You know, I knew I had a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I was stupid to think he was going to change. And the the minute I got pregnant, um, you know, he's, he's goes straight to drugs. Like he's using, and I'm just kind of left. Like, you know, I say this often, I'm not a martyr. Um, just because I made it through that pregnancy without getting high does not mean that it wasn't on my mind. I did that for my son. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. strictly it. But when I was five months pregnant, my husband at the time came home and he beat the snot out of me for the first time. He picked me up by my throat and just beat the snot out of me. And I just remember being so scared. Like I knew I didn't deserve it. I didn't know why it was happening. You know, I have a background, a family that adored me. So yeah. how did I end up here? How it was yeah. this happening? It was like, everything was in slow-mo. And I don't think I was prepared. Like when you see it on the movies and when you see violence, you think that, oh, how, you think you know how you would feel. You don't. You don't. No. It, no. I went into like, I was just paralyzed, you know, and I, my brain talked me into me believing that he loved me so much. He had to do that. I don't know why that happened. And I've spoken with a lot of other women in domestic violence situations, and they thought that too. It's like that, because I, it wasn't like I made him do that. You know how you, women will, like, that wasn't me. Yeah. I yeah. thought that he had to do that. He loved me so much. It was passion. He, it's he, not anger, it's yeah. passion, right? Yeah, yeah and it's like know. they don't understand our love story, and they don't get it. Yeah. And yeah. it sounds so crazy now. But mm-hmm. I... I can tell you, if if you don't mind me interrupting, I I can tell you, it seems to me that almost every time I've heard that story and I've heard that story change, you know, people, places and things, but it's all the same story, right? At the end of that part of it, beautiful, confident women that find themselves going, what the hell happened? It's always, it's the same 
thing that, you know, it's like, how does this, you know, and at, at a point in, in talking to all of these women over the years that I have, I said to myself, there is no way I'm going to understand this, the psychology as to how that happens. So I, I understand that I will never understand. And I had to leave it at that because I just, right. I was going crazy trying to figure it out. Right. So continue though. I, continue, please. I yeah. think what I've figured out in therapy is this, this, and I'm speaking for me, my whole life, I was what everybody called the pretty one, but yeah. I wanted to be the smart one or the funny one. Mm -hmm. And my identity Being the funny was one's found, overrated, trust me. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, my identity was found in, in, the, in that. And so I didn't find worth in it, I think maybe. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah. it did happen. Like, it happened to me. And he would, he would beat me down and he would say, you're so stupid. You're trash. He'd make me eat the di my dinner off the floor if I messed dinner up. But I'll never tell you you're not beautiful. <laughs> Because wow. I think he knew that that was the one thing that, yeah. like, I, of course I wanted him to think I was beautiful, but I wanted him to think I was so many other things, too. Mm -hmm. And he, he used it against me. Um, he is a 12 or 13 time convicted felon. Um, he is affiliated, and I was scared. His family had a lot of money, you know, and I felt like I was just gonna die like that and didn't even want to leave him I'll be honest with you about that you know he told me my oldest son and him got very close and you know we him and I've just had a baby but he would tell me I'll make your children hate you I'll make the boys hate you they'll choose me every time yeah and yeah. it was hard to deal with and he eventually hurt me pretty bad and went and robbed the Waffle House and got sentenced to six years but not before he got me on the needle. I take accountability, but I would yeah. not have done it um, had he not say, we are doing this, like we're doing this. I remember the first time I was scared to death. I remember I was, of all things, I was praying. I didn't want to die. And uh, you know as well as I do that, I'm assuming you do, that the, the administration, once you go that route, nothing else. That's it. Yeah. It's it. That's right. That's it. Yep. Like I might not have enjoyed the actual needle use, but the rest of it, that's a wreck. Nothing else works after that. And so here it is. He goes off to prison and I've got this needle habit and I don't really have a place to go and I'm not going to leave him. He's going to do six years. And I did have a guy that I was friends with. I've been friends with for a long time who I also knew had the same habit as me. Yeah. And I thought, well, we'll just, I'll just be with him. And we end up homeless together. My parents step in and take my boy. And that was the most painful moment of my life. Um, Collins was two. My boys are 11 years apart. My oldest saw horrific abuse. And um, my youngest has no recollection of it. I'm very thankful that he has no yeah. memory. Uh, and I'm so thankful that my oldest is okay. Um, okay. Forgiving myself for that is not even something I'm 100% sure that I've done. I say that I've done it, but I still have my moments where I'm just Of course you do. Um, and yeah. that's human. I think if anybody who just didn't have those moments, I would be concerned about, I guess. Is what I'm of course. Saying. Of course, right? Yep. But I go, I get, I get so bad off. I um, would use my face. Um, at one point, I had tracks all through here. Um, this big hole right here is from Immersa. I was using my face. Wow. Wow. I, I honestly, in the hundreds of stories, I've never heard somebody injecting in their face. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, it was horrible. Um, because of my training in aesthetics, I was very familiar with the, uh, the, the veins in the face. And I would cut my circulation off in my neck and make it pop. And um, like, how wow. bad off do you have to be? I'm kidding. I me. didn't care. Um, I wanted my kids. And but this is the thing about addiction. Looking back at it, why didn't I just go to rehab like my parents wanted me to? Wow. Why yeah. did I continue? But the addicted brain. I thought I was going to die without the drug, and it it it, yeah. it crosses this line where you're not. It's a sickness. You're not making sense. Like there's no, no. no sense to be made.
No, and of course not. It's, you're, you're, when you're in a heavy, especially opioid addiction, the, your frontal, prefrontal cortex is not working. You are, you are literally an insane person. Yeah. <laughs> like you yeah, have I mean, almost no access to rational decision making. So th mm -hmm. that's why, right? I, I mean, that's why. Go. And it's trying, I've tried to explain that to people. And it's just like, yeah, it's, it's an insane person yeah. being asked to make a sane choice. That That's what you're exactly. asking somebody, you know? Right? And so yeah. we're talking about a woman who had been so put together and had this life. And now I don't even look human anymore. Um, yeah. uh, my habit had gotten heavy that I just went and got on Subutex and um, I was injecting that. And I like to tell people that sobriety is a, a, a state of mind. If you make the choice to get on mat or whatever you're doing and you're bettering your life, you're okay. Yeah. It ain't my, yeah. it just, that's not, it, it's not how I did it. Like I was just, I didn't go yeah. into it with the right frame of mind. That's what I'm trying to say. And that stuff is not meant to be injected. But I, I've got MRSA lesions coming up all over me. I mean, I, it is, it is horrendous. At one point, I flatlined twice. Right after my last overdose, I was dead for three and a half minutes. And after they pulled me off the vent, I ran out of the hospital to avoid going to the insane unit at LSU across the highway barefoot, just barefoot, running across the highway. Like, that's what cool. drugs does to you. Yep. And I caught my first felony with my ex-husband and I got off probation. Felony number two is prescription fraud. And I'm, I'm now I'm an in-state fugitive. I'm not checking in. Like, I'm not doing yeah. any of that. And I'm living, uh, running around with this guy without my kids. And I want to get clean. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to get clean so bad. But I can't get through the withdrawal. Um, you know, I'm hiding in Amwas and buildings when the police are looking for me. Like, I'm living this life that is so stressful and so disgusting. And um, there's no other way to say it. I stink. My body's rotten. I'm covered in infection. And I decide that I'm going to leave and go stay with a friend. And the guy that I was staying with is driving down the road, has stolen plates, gets pulled over, and... They take him in for like a child support warrant and all this stuff. Well, I, when I find that out, I text the landlord. We had been living in this building. It was no electricity or anything. It's like a slum apartment. It Like that's where that Alma was that I was hiding in. Yeah. And I said, he's at Caddo. I'm not going back because the lease is in my name. I said, I'm not going back, you know, whatever. I throw my drugs out. Well, they go to do a welfare check and he's been burglarizing i can't i never say that word it's been what uh, he's been dude, simple burglary was a charge i tried to say burglarizing oh burglarizing okay 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 <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they, they find some of the stolen goods in the in yeah. the thing so they don't know where to find me but they know where to find him so they go to Cato and he's like she's an in-state fugitive and she did it all how to deal with me i'll tell you where she's at yeah yeah so um, was I innocent? No. Did I help him spend the money? Yes. But did I actually do it? No. We did that together. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. it's December the 26th of 2016. I'm completely covered in MRSA. I'm three days, so like three days drug free, sicker than just getting sick. Yeah, and yeah, I right. get mad and I start screaming at the top of my lungs. Hey, God, I was like, um, I'm going to need you to show up. I can't do this anymore. Um mm -hmm. I'm miserable, do something, I'm mad. And my friend comes running down the hall and she says, Nicole, the house is surrounded. And I said, what? And I knew right then that my prayer had been answered. And I'm not a super, um, I wasn't a super religious person. I think religion gets in the way. I think Christians might be the worst thing that ever happened to Jesus because all they do is judge and they talk down at you. I've been talked down to in addiction. It doesn't help. Nope. You know, and not to nope. mention Jesus picked that out, but nobody wants to talk about that. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> they just don't. Yeah. And I made a, a, like a, a choice right then that I was going to make this the best thing that ever happened to me. I had no idea that I was going to be sentenced to five years. And I had Oof. no idea that I was going to do two on that five when I only should have done nine months because it's not, uh, it wasn't an aggravated crime. It wasn't violent. Yeah. 
three days after my arrest, I went into kidney failure and they shackled me to a bed in the basement of the hospital. And it was the hardest thing I ever went through. Knowing that, I mean, I was going to have to sweat this out and, you know, now I'm in, now I'm incarcerated. I hadn't seen my kids in four years. I hadn't seen my parents in four years Mm -hmm. and I'm scared, you know, my hair was all the way down to my bottom matted. I hadn't shaved. Um, just uh, my teeth that were once perfect. My ex-husband busted this side really bad. So they were all missing and the rest were rotting. And I had to learn to love myself like that. Um, just broken like that. It was super scary. And I found my strength in those moments, those moments that I couldn't control my stomach or the vomiting. I, I found my strength in that. And people ask me how I stay sober. That withdrawal made me solid. Yeah. There was yeah. beauty in that suffering. And that's my story. And I don't think we all recover the same way. No. And it's okay. But that's what worked for me. Yeah. I needed to feel how dependent I had become on a drug. And I had to, right, I needed to understand it. So I didn't go back. And then I, I started breaking my myself down. Like, why don't I have self-esteem? Why don't I have self-worth? Why did I do these things? Um, and how did this happen to me? And I, I went through 45 days being shackled, you know, to that bed, just sicker than a dog with all these ideas that you can't come up with and answer in 45 days. But it was the start. Yeah. Once they moved me into general population, in the beginning, the other inmates made fun of me um, because they thought I had AIDS. Um, I, I, I looked horrible. There was like over 70 of them. Just, I mean, it took almost a year to heal. I'm covered in scars. And it was traumatic. Um, my father came to see me and brought pictures of my kids. And he was like, you know, that moment where my dad was on the other side of that glass and I was in a jumpsuit and shackled and in his eyes, like I had been his little girl, you know, the beauty pageant, the homecoming queen, you know, the, all his memories. And now I'm standing there like that and I've got sores up my arms. I've still got sores on my face. And he thought somebody was hurting me. He asked, you know, and I was like, daddy, I'm going to, I'm going to be okay. Just don't leave me in here. And I'm sorry. And he never shamed me. He told me that he loved me and that he was going to help me. This was my thought. And I grabbed onto it, you know, and I, it sounds crazy, but I couldn't wait to get to prison so I could hold my parents, you know, because while I was in maximum security, there's no, there's no touching, you know? And so like when they, when they shipped me to prison, like I couldn't wait for that first visit so I could just hold my parents. They did bring my oldest one to see me. And he was 16 and it was, you know, my youngest had, he didn't even know who I was and I had to cope with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. He's, he's like six at this point and he hasn't seen his mom in four years. So I didn't, we didn't want the meeting to be in prison like that. He was a shot, you know what I mean? But Colby was yeah. 16 and of all things, that's how I found out that I was going to be a guardian mother. And I remember thinking, well, this is a bad country music video. I'm in prison. Mm. It's a 16 year old yeah, coming over here yeah. to tell you going to get that. <laughs> but, you know, he's still with his wife. They've been together 10 years and they just had their second baby. So I did something. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah, yeah. No kidding. Eh? <laughs> like, Holy cow. Yeah, I did yeah. something right. That's, but, that's unheard um, of. Jeez. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. Yeah. I'm not yeah. heard of me. The first yeah. one that count, he was like five minutes. And then the second one was the, the abusive one. And yes, Brandon's yes, my course, forever. Yeah. But, you know, I had to take the time. And it, there's so much drugs in prison. Like, I hate it when people say your prison sober time don't count. The hell it don't. Yeah. Right, there, right. yeah. Like, it does. <laughs> because yeah, it was everywhere. You know, I mean, it is everywhere yeah. in front of me. And, I was, you know, I was like, no, yeah. I don't want it. And I pushed through and I had yeah. to. And, and if ever, it, it, I'll interrupt again. It, if ever there was a time when, when a coping mechanism is needed, it's while you're in prison. So, yeah, it counts. 
right? Absolutely, it, it counts. counts. Right? I was There's thinking... all sorts of shit I don't want to feel. And I've got some stuff hardwired into me on how to deal with things I don't want to feel. So yeah, that stuff counts if and you don't, if you don't succumb to those. It absolutely counts. Right? Yeah. And yeah. when you've yeah. been comatose as long as I was, and you haven't seen your kids, you got to, yes. like every emotion you didn't want to feel for however long you were high, it's yeah. coming back full throttle. Yeah. And trust yeah. me, you don't want to deal with it in, in prison. And I forced myself yeah. to do it. The, the best myself. part about recovery is feeling all the feelings. The worst part about recovery is feeling all the feelings, right? So, feeling all the feelings. And the only way to get <laughs> yeah. through it is to go through it. Yeah. The only yeah. way to finish it is to go through it. All right. Let's and have a cliche scary. back and forth now, shall we? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> but it, it, just, yeah. Yeah. It, it was something, you know. And I just remember, like, being scared, you know, and having to act like I wasn't. Like, because... Mm -hmm. There's some there's some tough chicks in there that I didn't want to make mad, you know, like y'all leave me alone. Yeah. Like I just I'm trying to do my time and get out of here. And I met some insanely amazing women in there. Women that have been yeah. abused and killed their abuser. You know, Louisiana doesn't right. have the proper laws for that. And yeah. I, I remember yeah. thinking I'm walking out here for all these women because I was this woman, you know, I've got the story. And mm -hmm. after um about a month before my release, my I called my mom and she's like, hey, listen, your aunt met this lady in Mississippi. Now we're in Louisiana and we've okay. made arrangements for you to go to a women's shelter in Alexandria, Louisiana. Now I'm, that does not make me happy. I am <laughs> mad. I'm thinking I've been in prison for two years and y'all are sending me to a women's shelter? Y'all got me messed up. Like, <laughs> I'm just like, oh, I'm but it, it just goes down to trust in the process. And when you don't want, when you're uncomfortable is when you're going to grow. So I thought, I'm not going to fight it. I've got my, you know, my kids are back in my life. My family's back in my life. Yeah. I've got to be accountable. And that might not look like, you know, what I want. So yeah. I'm going to trust the process. And the woman that my aunt may, met that day is my mother. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, I, she it was it was a god thing and i got out of prison and then got baptized she was in the water with me and then two days later met her son yeah yeah and brandon and me he has been clean for almost eight years off a of mess his story is totally different than mine he is yeah. banging meth and 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 wild crazy sex and with all these crazy people my addiction is like a long getting beat. I mean, it's totally opposite. And we met each other. It just worked. And, you know, they say that if you're in recovery, you shouldn't date somebody else in recovery. But he had the same amount of clean time as me. Um, yeah. And it wasn't like it was brand new. And we decided to instantly get married. And everybody thought we were nuts. They were like, here we go. Here we go. You know? <laughs> and we... Yeah, and we just did it all the time. I was driving in a lot of sport, and yeah. uh, we did it anyway. And my husband had a dream. He, his big dream is to do like an actual huge rehab. Lord willing, we ever get the funding for that. But he wanted to do sober living, mm -hmm. and um, that's what we've been doing for the last four and a half years. Um, my oh, husband's wow. in the street. Yeah, my husband's in the streets helping people. And my oh, media wonderful. does help, yeah, help support it. Yeah. We're both published authors. Together, we make an insanely good team because I'm opiates and benzos and he's meth. Yeah. And yeah. so, like, we understand the full, uh, just the big picture of everything. Uh, we're yeah. both only children and we were both spoiled. Um, okay. And we believe that so many people in addiction don't have the, uh, the foundation or their families given up on them and thrown them out. Our family didn't do that to us, so we try to give back and help the people who don't have the family or the family don't want anything to do with them. Yes. And okay. that's what yeah. we're doing. It warms my heart. You are my people, for sure. <laughs> he, yes. Yeah. And he, yeah. it's tough, you know? Like, it's tough because with addiction, there is so much failure because it's such a strong disease that so many people don't make it and so we're constantly having to deal with relapses and you want to talk about break your heart try putting somebody down on the street because they failed a drug test and they're out of chances you know, it, yeah. it's miserable 
but, but we can't enable and we and we we do call them you know call other people to help and bring them in but there's been time I and mean, it's horrible like to the point to where I, I, it hurts so bad it's just uh, it's a imagine. hard yeah it's it's a hard job because <laughs> the idea of somebody not having a place to sleep at night because we put them out is you know it's hard you gotta be tough you gotta know when to say no you're not ready or okay we're gonna try different avenues and it's been strenuous um but worth it because when you see somebody come through that darkness and they're getting their life back you're so proud of them that that moment gets us to the next Um, right right. and my with everything that i've been through i like to tell people like don't give up because i was a hopeless junkie i was the one that when people saw it in public, uh, it was noticeable. I looked like garbage. Yeah. And now yeah. when people find out I've been in prison or I was an addict, they're like, oh, wait, she probably took two pills. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because you can, you can rebuild your life, you know, and Absolutely. I love seeing Absolutely. people. Yes. Yeah, all of us, when we rebuild and people don't realize we've been in addiction, it's, you know what I mean? Because we're making <laughs> yeah. good choices and it's like a good thing. But because I was so serious about recovering, a few years back, I started getting sick. And um, I've, I'm in more pain than I think I've ever been in my life. And it's it's hard going through this, you know what I mean? Because I don't have opiates on the option for me. Okay. And um, my, they finally have found what's wrong with me. I've got Raynaud's disease and rheumatoid arthritis. They thought it was multiple sclerosis. Um, but what's what's Raynon's disease? Sorry if that's Raynon's is I wish can you see my hands right now? I can see them, yeah. Yeah. They're a little uh, can you see the spot? Not Those really, are no. completely no. black. Um so oh, okay. the circulation will not go into my hands. Literally all my blood will stay in my torso and my arms and legs start to turn purple. And oh, wow. it's very painful. Um and then not to mention the rheumatoid arthritis. And when you hear oh, rheumatoid oh, yeah. arthritis You don't realize that's not just arthritis. That is affecting your lungs, your heart, fatigue. I mean, it's a serious disease. Yeah. They didn't do it justice by putting arthritis in the name. My husband, like, I went from the woman that was so broken and beaten. This man has been with me, like, through it all. He takes care of me. He tells me I'm beautiful at my ugly, I mean, at my ugliest point. You know what I mean? And I fell in love with him when I asked him one night, I said, what's your favorite thing about me? And he said, you're scarred. (laughs) Nobody had ever told me that. I had been. I would marry him fast. Jeez. (laughs) I mean, I had just been, nobody had ever seen my work, you know, like nobody had ever seen me. Yeah. And when he said that, I was like, this is the right person, you know, and. Like I had to overcome a lot. I had all my teeth pulled out wide awake and didn't take pain meds. Um, mm. That's how serious I am about my recovery. I could even talk about having dentures a few years back um, because it embarrasses me, but it's a part of my recovery. Yeah, um, yeah. I put together the best that I can be. And yeah. it, I've just overcome so much and, and being able to just be me and talk about what, is wrong with me is huge for me that I don't have to pretend to be perfect. And that, yes. cause that was my problem. And I did learn in therapy for years that self-esteem is built when you're a child and you complete your tra- a task on your own and you know, yep. you can do it. I never did that. I had never even watched a load of clothes at 18 when I moved away from college. Like everything oh, wow. had been done for me. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. Very different life. I, I'll tell you a quick funny. <laughs> seven years old family supper i stand up on my chair and tell the family that laundry is women's work right so guess who showed me how to do my own laundry the next day yeah <laughs> it wasn't mom right. it was dad right <laughs> Let me tell you. right exactly it, yeah. it, very very I was, different <laughs> yeah i was super super spoiled and it doesn't like i tell people all the time you can't spoil your kids right where you end up with me like i got three felonies i was married to this famous criminal, you don't want to meet that virgin of me. Like this healed me, and yeah. you don't want to know what it took to get me here. <laughs> but we—it's just 
life is crazy. And if somebody would have told me when I was sitting in prison that today I would be helping other people, you know, my media blew up, not by plan. That was not, I was bored during 2020. Like I'm literally a middle-aged woman. <laughs> like, why would I, you know, it just happened. And I use it differently. I just do like that. But like, you know, here it is. I'm going to do menopause. Let's get TikTok famous. No, that's not, that's not how that happened. But I just wanted to use my story to help other people. And I think it's important. And I think if, because we all recover differently. I think if all of us like got together and helped everybody, it would oh. be so much better for it. Absolutely. And that's mm -hmm. why my husband and I are kind of controversial because we don't think there's just one way to recover. And a lot of people get stuck in that. My way is the only way. Oh and yeah. I've, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. I'm uh, I'm very much of the same mind as you are. I, Whatever, whatever's working for you is exactly the right path, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, I'm just, who am I to exactly. say, right? So I um, uh, I was shamed out of the rooms. I don't know. I chose to fund a resentment based on shame after my, my first 30 days I'd ever had in my life um, was just a couple, two and a half years ago or so now, something like that, ever. I was so proud of it. And then a few days later, I slipped and I still... The idea of going back to zero and having to face all those people took that from what would have been a day and a half and turned it into 10 months. Yeah. Right. Because of that, that, that thing. And that's, that's me, right? That wasn't them that did that to me. That was how I chose to take it. I found a resentment and I ran with it. Let's be honest. Right. right. But it was the shame of going back that I held on to mm -hmm. of having to go back to zero. And that's to this day why I don't consider myself a 12 stepper. Right. I, I think I'm it's great sure. for so many people. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Whatever you think about 12 steps, when you first get into recovery, when you're first trying to get sober and you need that fellowship, there's just no easier, better place to find it. Okay. If it works for you, great, and you run with it. If it doesn't and you find another path, but whatever you think of it, the fellowship is irreplaceable in my mind. It's just, it's the easiest place to find it, right? You know? I agree. And, you know, like, perfect. Perfect example, like I watch our guys that are newly sober do that and you're 100% correct. But then you've got my story. I did two years in prison. Yeah, so, so that, would, that would have been all out of prison, seven, I was forced to, yeah, in the women's yeah. shelter, I was forced to go to meetings. And yeah. I was, it did not, it was depressing for me. Like I yeah. was ready to like hit life. Like I've been sitting in prison for two years. Like I want, you know what I mean? Like I wasn't oh, I struggling. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. struggling. Because prison scared all that mess out of me. Like, I wasn't going back. I ain't built like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. It just, like, I was ready to live my life. And yeah. so it just didn't work for me. And forcing me to do it, it made me angry. You know, but in the beginning, I definitely, definitely would have needed that. And of I course, see it benefit our guys. But it just, we're all different. And I would sat for two years, you know, and it was yeah. like, no. Like, no yeah, and, and like you said, I think all that's different, right? Which, right. if we circle back to the very beginning of the episode, I said there are some language that you use in, in a TikTok. Yes. yes, it was. You said I consider myself recovered. It was like, oh, yes. All right, so that that's going against the grade of of that of that world as well, right? Of of even just saying exactly. that because, right? And very recently, um, it, it's a new friend that I met here in Thailand. I, I was telling about a story that had happened when I was married like ten years ago, and I was helping my fiance get divorced from her second husband I should have seen that coming anyway um and it was i was gonna have to sell my race car to pay for the lawyer and she's like a race car you didn't have money you're a drug addict and that's why right there right i don't want to be that person to everybody i meet for the rest of my life and I, yes. i'm not going to identify as an addict i've only got 19 months in now 19 months tomorrow but it, it, to me that's not how i'm going to identify Right. I'm, oh, I'm you know, a survivor of addiction. I'm, I'm all these different things that you want to call it. Right. But I, I personally will not identify as a drug addict for the rest of my life. It's just not something I will do. I'm, not, right? I, no. I'm definitely not going to. There's also so much power in your words. Like, mm -hmm. And this is the example that I give when I offend somebody by saying I'm recovered. It's not yeah. meant to offend anybody. Yeah. It, it's my personal opinion. But when you go through cancer treatment and you get in remission and you ring the bell, you no longer identify as a cancer patient. You no longer say, I have cancer. Yes. 
Yes. My, <laughs> my co-host on the weekend ramble episodes of our show is a psychiatrist. And she has said almost word for word what you just said, right? She has a real hard, like, she takes exception to people calling themselves addict, right? And it's yep, like, because- well, if people can call themselves whatever they want. We typically don't even use the word addict when referring to anybody on the show now these, these days, though, right? When referring to right. another person because, right? Yeah, for, for that exact reason, right? Um, yeah, you wouldn't identify, you, you, you wouldn't refer to your loved one as, this is my cancer patient. This is, you know, yeah. I have a cancer patient for a brother or, but you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. there, there's something I mean, else it, it, before their disease, right? So, right. right. And I also don't walk up to people and give them my DOC number because it's, yeah. it, it doesn't matter anymore. Like, cause I'm not yeah. an inmate anymore. Like there's a million ways you can look at it. And for me, like, especially the way my psychology is, if I'm going to sit there and say I'm an addict and all this, like, it's going to depress me. Like that I have to shut the book and move on. Like PTSD was a big part of my life. Um, yes. I have finally gotten past that. It took a lot of work, um, but I have gotten past it. And did, I'm thankful for Did you for go it. to a trauma-specific therapy or, or what did you do there? I, I have a psychiatrist and a, a Christian counselor. But my psychiatrist okay. has worked with me like heavy. Come to find okay. out I'm like super neurotic. I didn't know that. I've been that way my whole life. <laughs> like, you know how they get to know you? And it's like, has anybody ever told you you're severely neurotic? And I'm like, I break out neurotic hives. And I have. I remember yes. being like, since I was a little bitty, I will break out in these like red splotches. And the doctor said it was neurotic hives when I was a kid. But I worry <laughs> about something so stupid. And I'm just really neurotic. You take that. And put it with abuse, like, I'm not kidding. The first three years of my sobriety, I was like, like, <laughs> just dribbling. And it was, I was like, I'm something, it got worse. And it was like, is it, when is this going to stop? Nicole, get a grip. And I finally okay. got to the point to where I'm okay. But it took <laughs> some time, and it was a lot of work. So if we can move now to, you, you've got recovery, or, uh, sober living. How many beds? How many beds you got going on there? 12 and we are okay. trying we at one point we had three houses so it was like 38 beds total i think because one house wow. was really large and then COVID happened and we went back down to one but yeah. it's easier to work with just the one house and we really yeah. want to open up a rehab like and my husband has big dreams like he thinks like on the hundred scale and i'm thinking that is a lot of <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people brandon <laughs> like, why do we go big or go home? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's what, yeah. if we could get the funding, and he believes with his whole heart that we will one day. I think when I first went by there, he got that was the answer, and I was like, don't put that <laughs> on me, because yeah. it's just a, you know, it's just a Bible, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but I, I believe that we'll get there one day, because we have the want to help people, you know, yeah, it's just, yeah. we don't have the funding, and, that, and that yeah. it's expensive like even the sober living house he oh, runs, yeah. we do lawnscaping like lawn and landscaping and my husband works like you i mean he works himself to the bone and we're paying you know sober living stuff because they do pay a little bit of a fee once they get on their their feet you know but it's not yeah. enough to cover everything people don't get well, that of it's, course yeah and but we believe in what we're doing and well, I, like i awesome. believe in him like i believe in my husband i think he can handle more than i can <laughs> I was the type of addict that I was just so manipulative and like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes I'm looking at somebody and I'm like, you're lying to me. Like, I know you're lying to me. My husband's not buying it. I'm like, like, <laughs> I can't deal with it. I, he, like, I, would, I, he, I believe that he can handle it and I'm going to be his backbone and I'm going to do what mm-hmm. I can to, to hold my husband up. Uh, that's awesome his heart is really big um and and what's this what's this going on about books you got books you published off um of yes i have i'm victorious my path to redemption i don't know if you can okay. see that that's my mugshot that's pretty huh? holy cow eh wow so, yeah wow so pretty. you would never yeah. see yeah okay yeah. okay yeah that yeah. is so all right, but anyway, this Victoria's my prevention, and his is my crystal romance. Um, my crystal romance. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Both you can get on Amazon. We do have some personal copies. 
Um, and we we're working on getting one link. My snip feed will bring you to all that. Um, I can okay, send you the okay. link. It's got all. Well, my and of course, we'll it. we'll have that on your bio page on on here yeah. as well, right? So that makes it nice and easy for everybody, right? But that's amazing. It's amazing. You got a hell of a story. You do. You do. I, I I do, and I and a I unique one. You. I've heard I've heard a lot of stories, Nicole. A lot, right? Because of course, doing what I do. Um, this is episode two hundred and forty four, I think. Um. I've never heard one like yours. <laughs> it's different. Um, I haven't met anybody else who's had their kneecap amputated either. Like uh, that's, I'm, I'm, no, they, no. I don't think I told you that. The last no, operation, didn't. they were, they removed it yeah. completely. So you just got like a straight leg now, like has it like no knee? No, it bends. They it bends, but you can oh. see the difference. Like okay, yeah, it's like totally flat. There's no patella oh, okay. there. See, okay. it's like yeah, I see it. Weird. I see it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had to learn to walk without it. I will fall over. I tell people who know me, like I've been standing on one leg for 20 years now. Okay, I'm not an over. Like, <laughs> just not over. Really, I'm not. I'm not. I promise. No, yeah. No, yeah. 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 Not real. I fall over several times a day. And uh, I wanted to personally thank you for for letting me tell the positive side. Uh, so no, many, it's... so many people want the gore, and I ah, no, no, they, no to the gore, no to the gore. And you know what's funny about that? You project what you reflect. So these, all these cliches and these little golden nuggets you get in recovery. And one of the things that was told to me early on was that I'll get to a point where it won't be about the addiction; it'll be about the recovery. And I said, I know. Just like I said, I know to all the other little cliches and gold nuggets and pieces of, you know, wisdom that were that were said to me in my early days. I know, I know, I know. But do you? And then one day, things, there's this, there's this metaphoric fence that you, you cross over into recovery from addiction. Well, it's not about not using anymore. It's about growing. And, and I can tell you that was the day that I found out I could come to Thailand. Like I can just, and it was like, instantly the show changed everything changed because my life was getting better i was feeling better and all of a sudden it was like okay maybe the audience doesn't want to hear all this blood and guts maybe the audience does want to hear about the message rather than the mess M maybe that's where the show needs to go and it's best moves i've ever made the show is, is it just continues to multiply in growth and it's amazing the things that are happening with it and wow. it was because I was I was starting to like what I was seeing and I you know you project what you reflect and I just I, I think that's where it came from right and now right that's typically what we do is we sit around talking about what's working what's not working you know what's pissing us off you know we do a lot of that right. <laughs> right. And like my story yeah. is um my story is very gory you know there's a lot in my book and so people want that and they they want to hear that but like I had gotten to the point to where I like I'm ready to like, of course I've got to go over some of it, but there's, there's so much positive stuff going on in my life. Like I have this medical condition and I'm still walking a mile every day. And I, the foundation of who I am was born out of prison in my recovery. And I use that for everything in my life. And, um, you know, I've built self-esteem and, and I've done all these things and I did it out of just ruins. And kidding, there's strength to be found there. And yeah. I think that people need to hear more of that. They need to, they need to see the message and leave the mess. And it, I think it's beautiful. So thank you. Ah, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> well, that brings us to my favorite part of the show. And that's the daily gratitudes. So what you got for us today, Nicole? Daily gratitude. I am, I am thankful um, literally for every thing that happened to me that was bad because it makes me appreciate even the little stuff and that's how I look at life I'm thankful for my freedom I'm thankful that I can walk even though sometimes it hurts I'm thankful for my husband who treats me you know wonderful and my kids but I'm thankful for me because I know that I can get through anything that's just I, that's the perspective I take on life like you can have a condition or the condition can have you. And I'm not going to let a condition have me. I'm going to be positive and I'm going to be thankful for everything in my life. And the outcome of that is up to me. 
So Absolutely. I'm thankful for that perspective. That's wonderful. I like that. Myself, I am thankful for my dumbass dog here. <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful for mine too. <laughs> He's always at my feet, you know. He's uh, his new name is get the fuck out of my way. But <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. I could get. <laughs> I um, would have let mine okay. in here, but he's a principal dog, and you would have thought I had a pig. He oh, snorts. Yeah. One of them, hey? One so of them. loud. Adorable, but kind of annoying at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Um, I'm also thankful that uh, that David's connected us. This has been an absolutely wonderful conversation, and I'm very, very grateful yeah. for you for making the time. I'm also grateful to every single person who continues to like, comment, share, do the things, talk about the show. Anytime you do any one of these things, you're getting me a little bit closer to living my best life. My best life is to make a humble living, spreading the message. And the message is this. If you are in active addiction right now, today could be the day. Today could be the day that you start a lifelong journey. Reach out to a friend, reach out to a family member, go to church, pray, go to a meeting, call into detox. I don't care. Do whatever it is you got to do to get that journey started. It's so much better than the alternative. If you have a loved one who's suffering an addiction right now, just taking the time to listen to our show, you just take one more minute out of your day and text that person. Let them know they are loved. Use the words. You are loved. That little glimmer of hope <laughs> just might be the thing that brings them back. <laughs> I didn't.